Greetings, ladies and gents, and welcome to this latest video for Retreat Hell, taken from the subreddit HFY. The link to the original is down below, and if you enjoy the story, head over there and let the author know. If you wish to support this channel, there are many ways to do so, also, strangely enough, listed down below. Don't forget to subscribe, or we'll have a platoon of angry cat-like creatures attacking you in your sleep. Anyways, on to the sci-fi. Retreat Hell, Chapter 17, Part 2 And of course, the Chinese and Russians are still clamoring for access to the portal. Secretary of State Jack Andrews flipped a page over in his notebook. The Russians are mostly making political moves and stirring up more issues on social media, but the Chinese have moved up the SSBN patrol and searched a whole surface action group for deployment that's headed to the South China Sea. They're definitely rattling their saber a bit, he frowned. It's more of a show of force than we would have expected from them, but they're still fired up for us spilling the beans on the SARS of strain outbreak that they tried to cover up last year. Bastards tried to affect the rest of the world to balance out fracking themselves, Richard said. It was a nasty virus, would have been a global pandemic if they'd gotten away with it. Their own people spilt the goddamn beans. We just helped them get past the state censors. Everyone in the room nodded in agreement, though some were more vehement than others. Still, we can't completely shut them out forever, Richard sighed. This is a portal to another world. It involves all of humanity. With all due respect, sir, General Butler said, straightening the jacket of his army uniform, it's on U.S. soil. It's our problem, our portal. Richard shook his head. It opened on our soil, and we have the responsibility to make sure Earth's interaction with the Gala aren't fecked up. But we should not block the rest of the world. We don't have that right, he chuckled. Besides, it's not our portal. It's the kingdom of Ganlin's portal. And Ganlin is steadily refusing to let us anywhere near the artifice that created and controls the portal, Andres said. Then they have declined all offers of additional security that we've made. Can't say I blame them in their shoes, General O'Connor said, slowly spinning his blue surface cap in his hands. They were facing extermination before it opened. And however much good we will have won with them by saving their asses, it's only been a month, General McKinney said. His own barracks cover sitting in a precise location on the table beside his own notepad. Trust takes time to build. Speaking of portals, Richard said, have we made any progress on something that'll block new portals from opening? If the Kishman can do it, what's stopping the elves from figuring it out? The artifices and the researchers Ganlin sent over have been looking into that, said Molly Panzavichia, the Secretary of Energy. They haven't had much progress yet, but given the precise requirements for opening a portal in the first place, they think a portal jammer should be possible, in theory at least, though they aren't sure about anything that would have an effect on the scale of a whole planet. And what about the idea of opening a second waterborne portal, Jack? Is that something that we want to look into? The Ganlin have expressed a mixed interest and reluctance at the idea. The availability of commercial shipping and trade and aiding U.S. Navy assets to the fight are very intriguing to them, but they are also concerned about creating additional points of access to their world, never mind the cost of opening a new portal. I'm not sure that's a good idea either, said Elsbeth Irving, the Secretary of Commerce. As much as the sea trade option could be beneficial to us and Ganlin, we already have concerns about the environmental and ecological impact of the San Diego portal. A water-based portal would be even worse, she said as she shook her head. Southern California has had enough problems with wildfires. An ecological collapse could be an economic disaster. Maybe, said the Secretary of the Interior, the ecological factor might not be as much of a concern as you would think. Though, it is too early for us to tell for sure. What do you mean, Janice? Well, the initial report I got yesterday says that while birds and other creatures have definitely been seen crossing both ways, they don't seem to travel far or stay long. 
Bacterial samples also aren't making any sense on either side. We're not sure what is going on. The Kishman didn't build any kind of environmental containment protocols into their portal, but something is having that kind of effect. Though it's not always consistent, she shook her head. More study and data are needed to make the sense of it, but everything we have seen indicates that there are far less ecological crossover than we would have expected. Interesting. Richards rubbed the corner of his mouth. Keep me appraised of what the researchers find out. Unless we close the portal and never open it again, I don't think it's possible to prevent ecological crossover, and a water portal might become necessary. But we should try and avoid an ecological disaster if we can. He turned to the Director of National Intelligence. What have you got, Harry? We're still building our intelligence networks in Gandon, but one of our assets did copy us on a report that raises a few red flags. He tapped his pen against his notepad. Turns out one of the lead portal researchers has recently killed in a lab accident that caused a fire. There was major damage to the building and the contents of the lab. They found a body. It was heavily charred, but still identifiable. And the man's neck was clearly broken. He wasn't supposed to be in the lab that day and didn't have any experiments planned that could have started a fire. Three of the prototype portal devices were also destroyed in the fire. It could be an accident. But like I said, there are a few other details that raise some red flags. Richard nodded. That does sound a little suspicious. I trust your judgment. If you think it's something to look into, do what you can to investigate it, with or without Gannon's support. You turn back to Molly and step up the portal jammer research. Yes, sir. Is there anything else? Uh, yes, sir. General McKinney sighed. Some of our marines were involved in a, um, international, uh, interplanetary incident while on liberty over the weekend. Jesus, Tom, Butler said. The very first day we send the marines on liberty in this new world, and they're already getting into trouble. Richard sighed, pinching his nose. This isn't another Okinawa incident, is it? Not at all, sir. McKinney shook his head. The Kishman artificer our marines adopted was almost murdered. He was framed as a deserter and almost hung for it. His squad leader intervened and, um, aggressively apprehended the Kenshman who framed him. She roped several on-duty marines into a posse, discharged another marine's firearm inside the town, and assaulted a foreign officer attached to her command, Butler said. She assaulted a Gandalin officer. She hauled him out of a crowd and beat the living shit out of him for trying to murder one of her men, sir, McKinney said. And what is Ganlin's stance in the matter? Andre sighed. Well, uh, Night Captain Anya, the officer in question, would probably want to press charges when he wakes up. But Night Captain Lashin, the CO of Second Artificer Yat's unit, is recommending against that. In fact, his official report commends Sergeant Bradford's defense of her men and indirectly recommends the Crown pursue murder charges against Lord Anyo. Why the feck? Was this night captain trying to murder one of his own people? Bad blood, sir, McKinney said. Anyo is a noble with very, um, feudalistic mindset. Hayat's family are technically yeoman, but functionally, he's a peasant. They had a spat where Hayat told him off, and Anyo's superior told him just to eat it, because he'd made an ass of himself. On top of that, Hayat's generally been performing well and showing up Anyo left and right. Not a purpose, I don't think. He's just really good, while Anya isn't, and Anya's taken him personally. Richard shook his head, flipping through the report McKinney had handed him. Any word on the Gandon's intentions for our Mulan character? Not as yet, sir. Best impression that we've got is that they're still stuck between embarrassment and the strategic need for a battlefield savant. Well, make it clear that we don't give a shit, and we'll gladly have her. He set the report down and dropped up some asylum requests. If Ganlon goes sour on either of them, America would be glad to welcome them. The Cashmen are not like that, sir. They can cry all they want. They need us more than we need them. What about Sergeant Bradford? O'Connor asked. Are we going to allow this precedent of enlisted marines assaulting allied officers? An officer who has attempted murder, the chairman of Joint Chief Staff muttered. Alleged, said the Chief of Naval Operations. 
Richard sighed. How the Marine Corps disciplines its Marines is the Corps' business, not mine. So long as it is in accordance with regulation, if Gandlin doesn't want to make a big stink about this, I see no need to. He pushed his chair back up. Now, if you'll excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, I have another briefing in twenty minutes, and I'd like to take a crap before then. Mixed chuckles drifted around the room as the men and women collected their reports and stood themselves. Dave, he said, looking at the Secretary of the Navy, I'm still expecting to see those contingency plans for naval operations on Gunland, with and without another portal and Goldfinch. Of course, Mr. President, this must... Radford stepped up to the doorway. It wasn't any fancier than any of the other rapidly built prefab doors scattered across the base, but the nameplate on the door carried a particular weight. Lieutenant Colonel Henry A. Michaels, CO, 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines. With a deep breath, she loudly rapped twice in the door. Enter! came in from the inside and she pushed through. Shutting the door behind her, she sharply marched forwards to stand at a crisp attention in front of the desk. Sergeant Bradford reporting as ordered, sir. She felt Sergeant Major Baracus's eyes boring into her as he glared at her from the side of the room, but she kept her gaze locked forward. Major Thomas Bloss, Echo Company staff, judge advocate, stood next to Michael's desk, across from Baracus. Major Winters stood next to him. Michael's eyed her up and down for a moment and then nodded to Bloss. Sergeant Bradford, he said picking up a clipboard and reading from it. Under Article 31 of the UCMJ, no person subject to this chapter may compel any person to incriminate himself or to answer any questions the answer to which may tend to incriminate him. No person subject to this chapter may interrogate or request any statement from an accused or a person suspected of an offence without first informing him of the nature of the accusation and advising him that he does not have to make any statements regarding the offence of which he is accused or suspected, and that any statement made by him may be used as evidence against him by a trial by court-martial. No person subject to this chapter may compel any person to make a statement or produce evidence before any military tribunal if the statement or evidence is not material to the issue and may tend to degrade him. No statement obtained from any person in violation of this article, or through use of for coercion, unlawful influence, or unlawful inducement may be received in evidence against him by the trial of court-martial. We lowered the paper and looked at Bradford. Do you understand your Article 31 rights, Sergeant Bradford? She took a deep breath. Yes, sir. It was all she could do to keep her voice from cracking as she felt the eyes of a battalion triad boring into her. Her locked muscles were the only thing keeping her from shaking. Bloss looked back down at the clipboard. Sergeant Bradford, you are suspected of the following offences committed on 5th of July 2020 at approximately 15.30 while serving as Second Squad Leader of Echo Company, 2nd Battalion, 5th Marine Regiment, 1st Marine Division, reinforced. He took a deep breath. Article 90 of the UMCJ in that you assaulted a commissioned officer of the Gamlet Royal Host to wit, you physically laid hands on Knight Captain Anyo, dragged him out of a crowd, and repeatedly struck him, inflicting grievous injury and rending a ring him unconscious. Article 90 of the UMCJ, in that you raised a harm inflicting weapon aggressively at a commissioned officer of the Gandan Royal Host to wit, you raised an M17 service pistol, borrowed from another Marine in the threat against Knight Captain Leshen, 9th Commander, 3rd Line, 5th Regiment, 9th Banner, Gandan Royal Host. Article 92 of the UCMJ, in that you fail to obey to leave for liberty policy of the 5th Marine Regiment to wit. You allowed yourself to become separated from your designated liberty buddy, fail to report the loss of your liberty buddy through the proper chain of command, fail to follow established protocol for separation from your liberty buddy, and fail to follow the policy on restricted areas by entering the Gandalin Royal Host Camp. Article 97 of the UCMJ meant that you unlawfully detained Knight Captain Anyo to wit. You pulled Knight Captain Anyo out of a crowd of Ganlan soldiers, rendered him unconscious, and carried him away from the army camp of the Ganlan Royal Host without direction or authorization. Article 116 of the UCMJ meant that you engaged in riot against forces of the Ganlan Royal Host to wit. 
you led members of your squad in a display of threats and physical violence against members of the 3rd Line, 5th Regiment, 9th Banner of the Gannon Royal Host. Article 117 of the UCMJ, in that you made provoking speech against another person to wit. You threatened Knight Captain Leshen, Line Commander, 3rd Line, 5th Regiment, 9th Banner, Gannon Host, with the statement that you would, quote, put a bullet between your eyes, end quote. Article 147 of the UCMJ, in that you maimed Knight Captain Anyo to wit. You repeatedly and reforcefully struck Knight Captain Anyo, inflicting the following deformed injuries, a broken orbital, a broken cheekbone, and a globe rupture of the left eyeball. Article 134, in that you assaulted Knight Captain Anyo with the intent to commit voluntary manslaughter to wit. In a blind rage, you dragged Knight Captain Anya out of a crowd and repeatedly struck him with a great force until physically dragged away from him by other marines, inflicting grievous injury and placing him into a life-threatening coma. Article 134, in that you willfully and wrongfully discharged a firearm to wit. You discharged a borrowed M17 service pistol three times inside of an occupied army camp of Ganon Royal Host, within the limits of the city of Tenye. Article 134, in that you wrongfully interfered with an adverse administrative proceeding to wit. You disrupted a lawful judicial proceeding of the commander of the 3rd Line, 5th Regiment, 9th Banner, Gannon Royal Host, in judgment of a suspected deserter. Article 134, in that you recklessly endangered members of Echo Company to wit. You led members of Echo Company to trespass in force onto the Gannon Royal Host Army Camp at Tenya and stand off against the substantial royal host force in that camp. Article 134, in that you disrespected a sentinel to wit. You confronted and led other marines in an assault against Piker Yushin, 8th Line, 2nd Regiment, 2nd Banner, Gannon Royal Host, while he was acting as a gate sentry breach in his post. Each article struck like a hammer blow as an enormous weight fell on her shoulders. She could hear the blood rushing in her ears as the world turned hollow. Do you understand the charges laid against you, Shard Bradford? Yes, sir, she said, staring at the hole in the space behind Colonel Michaels. Then sign your understanding of your Article 31 rights and the charges of which you have suspected, Bass said, handing her a clipboard and a pen. I, sir, she said mechanically, taking both and skimming the page before signing the appropriate block at the bottom. She handed the clipboard back. At ease, Sergeant, Michael said. Radford shifted to the correct posture, though not a single muscle in her body was relaxed. Tell me what happened, Sergeant. Michael's gaze was frighteningly neutral. Sir, Radford said. She swallowed. We were exploring the sound, sir, and I was helping Ayat look for a number of his personal items that were lost en route. What was the rest of your squad doing? I, uh, specifically don't know, sir. You don't know, Sergeant, Baraka said. How do you not know what your squad was doing? I, uh, haven't talked to them much about what they were doing, Sergeant Major. I, uh, I think Samson and... You think, Sergeant, Baraka's voice cut harder than a pistol drill, Sergeant, and Bradford instinctively snapped back to attention. What was their liberty plan, Sergeant? I don't know, Sergeant Major. You don't know? Did you have a liberty plan, Sergeant Bradford? No, Sergeant Major. You led a squad of marines on liberty in a foreign city for the first time any member of U.S. armed forces have done so in Gandan, and you didn't have a liberty plan. No, Sergeant Major. Why not, Sergeant Bradford? I didn't think of it, Sergeant Major. You didn't think, Sergeant Bradford. You didn't think. No, Sergeant Major. I didn't. Baracus exhaled through his nose, pinning her with a glare before he turned and paced away. How did you become separated from Second Artificer Yacht, Sergeant? Michaels asked as if her senior enlisted advisor hadn't just been screaming in her face. Radford took a deep breath. I had to use the head, sir. There was a public outhouse in the square outside the shop that we were in. I left to use it while a yacht remained in the shop. He said that he would wait for me in the front of the shop if I wasn't back before he was done there. She could feel Baracus's eyes boring into the back of her skull, but she said nothing to interrupt her. How long were you in there? Fifteen or twenty minutes, sir. And when you came out? I walked back to the shop, but Yacht wasn't there. I went inside, and he wasn't there either. I asked the shopkeeper about him, and he told me Kishman's soldiers took him. I knew something was up, 
and that he hadn't gone willingly. How did you know something was wrong? There was a half-eaten candy bar on the ground in front of the shop, sir. Hayat had packed a couple of them, but he hadn't traded any. And I've never seen him abandon food. Ever. What did you do next, Sergeant? I sent out a text to the squad group chat, sir. I told everyone that Hayat was in trouble and to meet me at the Gannon army camp. Did you attend to the library brief I gave Sergeant Bradford? Baraka snapped. Yes, Sergeant Major. Did you sleep through it, Sergeant Bradford? No, Sergeant Major. Then how the feck did you miss the part where I specifically said that the Gandolin Royal Host Camp was off limits? I didn't miss it, Sergeant Major. Do you take me seriously, Sergeant Bradford? Baracus was suddenly right next to her, looming over her shoulder. Yes, Sergeant Major. She kept her eyes locked forward, not daring to shift her posture. Do you think I'm a joke, Sergeant Bradford? No, Sergeant Major. Do you think that you can disregard my orders? Disregard the orders of the battalion commander? No, Sergeant Major. Then why the fact did you and your squad just do that, Sergeant Bradford? Even seeing where this was going with these questions, Bradford found herself at a loss for words before Baracus. I, I, do you make a habit of disobeying orders, Sergeant Bradford? No, Sergeant Major. Do you think it's okay to disobey orders, Sergeant Bradford? No, Sergeant Major. Then why the fuck did you think that it was okay just to do that, Sergeant Bradford? One of my men was in danger, Sergeant Major, Bradford shouted, her eyes locked onto the wall behind Colonel Michaels. She felt Baracus's eyes boring into the side of her skull. What did you do about that, Sergeant? I mustered my squad and went after him, Sergeant Major. And what were you supposed to do, Sergeant Bradford? Call for help and inform my chain of command, Sergeant Major. Why didn't you, Sergeant Bradford? You ran into Lieutenant Washburn. Why didn't you let her call for help and let the command handle the situation? Because Ren would have died. But I didn't know that. I... I don't know, Sergeant Major. Time felt short. I didn't think I could... You didn't think, Sergeant Bradford. That's the problem. Baracus turned away from her, pacing to the other side of the room... What did you do after you linked up with the rest of your squad, Sergeant? Michael's voice remained stone cold and calm, and he left her at attention. We headed to the Ganlin camp, sir. But just your squad? No, sir. I asked Lieutenant Washbourne to borrow a couple of her riflemen, and she gave me two. Lance Corporal Brickle and Centelli, sir. So you took two armed marines and a dozen unarmed marines in their alphas to storm an army camp that was home to roughly a quarter of an entire Ganlin royal host. I, um, she wanted to deny it, but realized that she couldn't argue the point. Yes, sir, she said, her shoulders sagging slightly as she acknowledged the absurdity of it. Go on. She took another deep breath. We, I, I confronted the sentry at the main gate into the garden and camp. He denied us entry, but I led the squad in, pushing past him. How did you find second artifice the Yats unit? Lance Corporal Stephen stood, sir. He spotted their unit banners. In typical space cadet fashion, she thought, remembering his exact words. Bah, those flags things look like the patch on S.H.I.E.L.D.'s old uniform. And what happened when you got there? She swallowed, her heart pounding as the scene flashed in her mind. They were about to hang him, sirs. His CEO was just given the order, and they were about to string him up. I had to do something to stop it. So I borrowed Brickle's sidearm and fired three times into the air. And why the feck did you think that was a good idea, Sergeant Bradford? Baracus was back at her side, shouting into her ear. I didn't think, Sergeant Major. That's fucking obvious, he shook his head. Did the Marine Corps ever teach you firearm safety, Sergeant Bradford? Yes, Sergeant Major. Were you ever taught target discipline, Sergeant Bradford? Yes, Sergeant Major. Do you know what happens to things that go up? Yes, Sergeant Major. And what happens to things that go up, Sergeant Bradford? They come back down, Sergeant Major. Did you forget any of that, Sergeant Bradford? No, Sergeant Major. Are you fucking lying to me, Sergeant Bradford? No, Sergeant Major. Are you sure, Sergeant Bradford? Because it damn sure sounds like you forgot all of it. Do you think you're a goddamn John Wayne, Sergeant Bradford? No, Sergeant Major. Do you think this is a movie or the Old West where you can just pop off shots wherever you fucking feel like it? No, Sergeant Major. Then why did you think that was a good idea? I... Uh, I didn't... You didn't think, Sergeant Bradford. Baracus turned away, and Bradford bit the inside of her cheek to maintain composure. 
Michaels allowed her to stand in silence for several seconds before continuing the questioning. What happened next, Sergeant? I confronted Ayat Siosa. We argued, I told him, and, uh, she took a deep breath, and, uh, his whole unit off for thinking that Ayat was a deserter. She paused, struggling to form a coherent words. The hangman was still pulling on Ayat's noose, and I, uh, I threatened to shoot his CO if he didn't put a stop to it. You threatened to shoot an officer? She could feel Barakas's gaze boring into her once more. Yes, Sergeant Major. Are you aware of the penalty for threatening an officer, Sergeant Bradford? Yes, Sergeant Major. He was trying to kill one of my men, Sergeant Major. One of his men, Sergeant. One of the men under his command. He's still one of my men too, Sergeant Major. And he was wrong. I couldn't let him just kill a yacht. She felt Barakas staring at her, but he gave no further response. How did my captain take that, Sergeant Bradford? He, um, uh, chewed the hangman out, sir. You threatened to shoot him, and in response he chewed out one of his own men. Yes, sir, the, uh, the night captain was very calm and composed through the whole thing, sir. Go on. She took another breath. After he got done chewing out the hangman, he asked if I had any proof of what I had said. And I did. I had a copy of Ayat's orders in my blouse pocket. Why did you have a copy of his orders on you? Neurotic habit, sir. I keep certain things in certain pockets, and everything gets moved when I change uniforms. It was an extra copy, but I figured that it would be good to hang on to. I just never got around to moving it out of my uniform, sir. I see. So you showed him the copy of Ayat's orders? Yes, sir. And he immediately ordered him to cut loose, and had his things returned to him. Michaels gave her a slight wave with his hand, prompting her to continue. We had a yacht back, and he got his stuff back, and at that point I decided it was best to get the hell out of there while we were ahead. And before anyone decided to do anything stupid, she grimaced, taking a deep breath. I took one more glance at the crowd that had gathered to watch the, um, execution, and that's when I saw him, Lord Anyo. And what did you do when you saw him? I, uh, I don't really remember, sir. I recognized him, and the whole situation just clicked. Then I saw red. Everything just went red, and, uh... I don't really remember anything after that until Kowalski and Gomez pulled me off of him. The fact scared her as much as anything else. I saw him in the crowd, then everything went red. Then he was out on the crowd, and Kowalski and Gomez were pulling me off of him. And I remembered where we were at the time was going on. I went limp to let them know I was done, and they stood me back up. I ordered a couple of the guys to grab Anya, and then we left. Nobody stopped us. Not even the gate sentry. Not until we ran into the army unit responding to gunfire. You don't remember assaulting Captain Anya? Barakas asked. No, Sergeant Major. You broke his skull, Sergeant. You punched him so hard, his eye ruptured and popped out of its socket. You don't remember any of that? No, Sergeant Major. Do you know that we're in a time of war, Sergeant Bradford? Yes, Sergeant Major. Do you know what the penalty for assaulting an officer in a time of war is, Sergeant Bradford? She swallowed. Yes, Sergeant Major. What is that penalty, Sergeant? Death, Sergeant Major. Her face felt hollow. What is the penalty for threatening an officer in a time of war? Death, Sergeant Major. Her stomach fell away. The penalty for rioting? Death, Sergeant Major. She felt the blood draining from her face. Disobeying orders? Death, Sergeant Major. A distant, ringing drone filled her ears, and she had to suppress the urge to throw up. All twelve of these charges can carry a death penalty in a time of war. Do you understand that, Sergeant? Yes, Sergeant Major. Do you understand how much you fecked up, Sergeant Bradford? Yes, Sergeant Major, she said, gritting her teeth to keep them from chattering. Her arms clenched against the side as much to keep herself from shaking as to maintain attention. I don't have any more questions for you today, Sergeant Bradford, Michael said. You will be informed when I have made my decision. Your decision, sir, on whether or not to recommend you for a court-martial. You are dismissed, Sergeant. Aye, aye, sir. Somehow she maintained to make her bowed face parade ground perfect and marched to the door with a crisp precision, her back as stiff as a ramrod. It was barely closed behind her before tears came, and she had to clamp both her hands over her mouth to stifle her cries. End of chapter. 
The algorithm reckons you should be watching this video next, and I recommend that you should be always watching my video. So, click, click, click. With energy! And yes, clicking that does help the channel. Thank you very much. I just want to give a quick thank you to the T5 members and patrons. Alithia, Barky, Furic Yol, Cam Maxwell, Casper Arnholtz, Angry Marine, Lord Azrakel, White Van 420, and Arcalian.